Well, Carol Reese, if everyone knows Carol, probably. She's uh, University of Tennessee. She works as an extension ornamental horticultural specialist from the Western District, but she covers just about everywhere in Tennessee. Um, she has her bachelor's and master's in horticulture from Mississippi State University. She is a nationally known speaker. She probably doesn't like to hear that, but she is and gardening and nature writer for several newspapers and magazines, which she does like to do. She likes to be a writer. She assists the green industry in the Western part of the state and also teaches master gardener classes. She evaluates plant material at the UT display gardens and at the UT experiment station. So we greet Carol and thank you very much. That was short and sweet. Thank y'all. Yeah, if you get this old, a lot of people do know who you are. You know, it's just sort of a by erosion of uh, ignorance. But yeah, this is one of my favorite topics. Um, you know, we, we have a lot of talk about what's going on in the environment. We're all getting more and more interested and concerned. And our clients um, would also like to hear that, I think, uh, from us about helping them establish a better balance in their landscape. So without further ado, I, I you know, we played around with this title. Lee was a little nervous about <laughs> Topic, sex in the garden. Um, so I decided this was a little milder, but really we're going to talk about pollination, but it's not nearly as much as interesting if you don't make it kind of just a hair, hair racy and it's importance to uh, landscapers of importance to understanding plant selection. So we're going to relate it to what you do. I mean, granted, I do like to talk about it and then forgive me for just a minute, but I'm going to sing to you. <clears throat> Birds do it. Beetles do it. Even flowers, shrubs, and trees do it. And I apologize. Uh, but it's true, and we need to think about that. A lot of people seem to sort of miss that fact that flowers are reproductive organs. That's what's going on. So when we talk about pollination, sort of a dry word. I mean, we understand the importance. And I also feel like sometimes its importance to the food industry is, you know, takes a big focus when truth is, what the heck's making the air we breathe and the, the soil is being anchored. You know, every plant out there um, is, pollination is important on all of those. It's funny that, you know, our egocentric self, it's like, what are we gonna eat? <laughs> Which we're probably all thinking about right now for lunch, right? Um, and I don't know why they made botany so boring. You know, it is an absolutely, here's, you know, our little drawing, fertilization, blah, 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 blah. When it's really, about making babies, you know, which is a fascinating subject. Goodness knows uh, how many romance novels are sold every, uh, I don't even want to even talk about videos viewed online by people in their dark bedrooms or anything. It's a fascinating topic. And so why didn't we make it about that? Because that would have really gotten our attention and this would maybe be a, a more exposed, uh, forgive the pun, subject. So really, when we do talk about that, um, you know, we need to understand that flowers are sex organs of the plant. You know, there's a reason that you would bring flowers maybe to your to your date, uh, romance, flowers. There's there's a lot of relationships there that you can think about that when we start thinking about our relationship to the rest of the world, that we're more alike than we are different when we start looking at some of these structures and and how we make babies. So. That's going to make it a little bit, we're going to make it just a hair racy. I try to be discreet, but uh, I'll walk a fine line with you, I'll admit tonight. The only uh, nudity will be um, of garden parts. So I, I am curious, it's always something that I've, you know, seem to work into every talk. And this talk was born because my friend Jason Reeves said, no matter what we ask you to talk about, somehow you managed to work sex into it. And he was vexed, actually. He's, he's pretty straight laced. And I said, well, why don't we just talk about that? At this point in my life, I'd rather really, really talk about it than participate. Oh, I'm so... Uh, all right, a little bit of a review, and I promise this will be short and sweet, of our basic botany, right? We have uh, the plants that have both flower parts on one. That's our hermaphroditic plants. We call those perfect. They got male and female parts, the bisexual uh, flowers. Then we have monoecious plants that are gonna have male and female flowers on the same plant. And the dioecious, we got a girl plant, we got a boy plant. And we need to know this uh, and how that relates to our landscape choices. So the perfect plants can pollinate themselves, but that's really not a good idea, right? You want to get some gene, um, some new genes introduced, you know, get some excitement going on, get some adaptation because that's how new plants adapt to changing environmental uh, conditions, which we're always going under on the earth, on the planet. So we know that pretty much, pretty many, Sorry, y'all. Let me have a drink of caffeine. I didn't get my second cup in. 
We know with squash plants, for example, that the male flowers are often the ones that will start in first. Everybody starts calling, don't they, Tom? Why am I squash plant making babies yet? Well, because the female flowers start a little bit later. And you can tell because you can look see the little baby squash, which is really the ovary hadn't been fertilized yet once it gets fertilized. And if you look at that and you think about womb, right? That's, that's basically when a woman gets impregnated and makes a belly and you know that's what we usually eat in these kinds of plants. And if you start looking at flowers closely, you'll recognize that not just in our vegetable plants, but for example, spice bush flowers, you see the round belly there, right? That's your female uh, plant and they are dioecious. So you have male spice bush and female spice bush. And then you might decide which one you would rather have. Um, personally, I like the females because the red berries are good for the songbirds and also because um, you can use them for spices. They're, they're big spice bush festivals in the Midwest. So that's one of the things that I like to celebrate is a lot of the wild plants that we can forage on when we're out in the wild. But <clears throat> when we talk about fruit of the womb, you need to realize that in botanical terms, fruits are anything that bears the seed, right? So an acorn is the fruit of the oak tree. So let's, let's kind of get the word fruit hammered in our brain as fruit can be any of these, a samara, um, a, a bean, those, those are all fruit. <clears throat> and here's an example of, of one of the plants that will have male and female on the same plant. And these are starting to, to bloom right now in the woods. If you like to wander in the woods and the dogs and I do that most every day, you'll find these dangling uh, on the elders, but also on our native uh, hazelnut, our filberts. And they're very common throughout West Tennessee. I run across them in almost every woodland I'm, in any house I've ever lived in West Tennessee. And they are, the male parts are dangling to disperse the pollen in the air and the little tiny red things you'll see back on the stems and you better hunt for them because they're really, really small. I mean, smaller than the tip of the end of your finger. You'll see the little bright, bright red stars and those are the female flowers on our native. Um, and they'll both be on the same plant. Um, the other plants that will have both male and female, you don't have to really worry about them self-pollinating. There are self-pollinating issues with the ones that are monoecious. Um, but these are ones that we use often in our landscape. If you read through them, some of them are and others not so much. And you uh, need to understand uh, if you don't want berries, you need to get a male. If you do want berries, you need to get a female and a male close enough to pollinate it. So these are interesting things for landscape choices and for success in your landscapes. If you want the deciduous holly to have the red berries, you better have a guy around. You better take home one if you don't know that there's supposed to be one there where others, you want to avoid it, right? Gecko females have very stinky fruit. Uh, you may not want the big Osage orange or what one I call Bodoc on your lawn. Um, I encourage people to leave it out in their pastures. It's actually a good food, not just for our cattle and horses as we've grown up, not poisonous, that's a myth, that's a myth. But also white-tailed deer love it, squirrels love it. A lot of people, you can find, go online, Google white-tailed deer eating Osage orange apples. So it has a great history in our country and I don't have time to go into all that today though. I'd love to talk about, um, you know, I love to call them plants that people love to hate. And when I tell their whole history, maybe they can learn to love them. So it's important to know uh, for your landscape choices here and spice bush I mentioned already, though male or female choices would be good for our cutest caterpillar. And that is the spice bush caterpillar, which will come there, lovely butterfly. Other things get really, really weird though. Those are kind of, you know, simplistic breakdowns, but fig is a very interesting plant. And, you know, I had to confess, I didn't really understand the sex life of figs until a few years ago, somebody asked me, what does the fig flower look like? And I thought, you know, I don't know what the fig flower looks like. And I went and Googled it, I found out we're eating the flower. So the, the, this is actually an, a, a flower that has inverted. All the flowers are inside, that's the pink are all the little flowers and the little wasp has to actually climb in there to fertilize them. Now, this is gonna be a little bit of a weird story, but that's what this talk is about because I think it's intriguing. If you know these details and you kind of tell these fun stories to your clients, um, they'll be very impressed and maybe think you're worth a little bit more money too than just the, the mow and blow guys. But the little wasp will climb in there. And that's called an osteole. And you know, if you wanna win a Scrabble game, or know the million dollar answer, there you go. You can send me some money for that. And this guy, I'm gonna give you the whole cycle here of what happens when the little wasp climbs in because it's very cool. She will climb in there and lay eggs. She's already been fertilized and she lays eggs on some of the flowers inside. 
and she's pollinating some of the other flowers as she does that. Then these, uh, these pollinated, I mean, the ones that she lays eggs in will form little larvae and they're inside little galls. Then the male wasps will come out of these galls and this is kind of weird. They run around and go ahead and pollinate the female wasp, you know, it's a better word for that, <clears throat> um, before they're even hatched out. Goodness, I'm not liking them young, that's pretty weird. Then the male flowers will burrow out holes for them to escape the females, and then they die in the, in the fig. So the females come out and they're crawling around trying to find their hole to escape. And meanwhile, they're gathering up pollen. Meanwhile, the male flowers have bloomed inside that fig. And so they're getting pollen on them. Then they find their way out and then they fly to another fig and they start the whole process over again. So are you eating little wasps when you eat figs? Um, yeah, nobody really worries about it. I mean, honestly, we don't have the right wasp here to get many pollinators. A lot of figs now are bred to produce what we call parthenocarpically without fertilization. But the little crunchy pieces in there <laughs> are the seeds a lot of times, especially when you're eating dried figs, which means, yeah, you're eating little, but we eat a lot of bugs actually in processed foods. So don't worry about it. It's good protein, et cetera, et cetera. But Google it up. It's pretty cool. All right, let's go back to pollination, and uh, you know, which I'm thrilled. I, I love that it's a big topic. I'm glad people are butterfly gardening, even though I resent the fact that butterflies are the cheerleaders, right? They're the pretty insects. And so I never got to be on the homecoming court. So I do resent it a little bit. But the truth is, it's really good for all the other insects, and then they can be the cheerleaders. I'm cool with that. Uh oh, hit the wrong button, y'all. Excuse me. Next. And the honeybees got the big poster. You know, these are poster children for pollinating, uh, pollination, and, and that's good. Again, they get lots of press, and if we're doing that, we're helping out all the other insects. Although I like to mention that honeybees, remember, are not native insects. They are introduced European insects. Um, but as we garden for them, we are also helping out the native insects. And I'm, I'm not a native purist by any means. I think any planting that we should have in our landscape should have a diverse array of native and non-native that flower and fruit at different times of the year and you'll get good predator prey relationships, good habitat, and you will have that, achieve that goal of pollinating for wildlife and providing for our pollinators. I'm, I'm a still fumble tongue, y'all, let me do another sip. All right, so in the human realm, let's look at just a minute, our strategies for making babies, right? Now I won't have to do that again. This is pretty, you know, nice meet and greet going on here. Sometimes it gets a little wilder. I don't know if I encourage that, but this is how we get together. And we're starting to think about how do male and females get together. And the ultimate goal, even though in, at this age, probably not, is to make babies. It's, our, it's in our DNA. <clears throat> Let's go back to this picture and start talking about how flowers uh, play a role in that. But not always. I mean, this is actually, this is meant to say, hey, baby, come over and pollinate me, right? And that's what big showy flowers do. But let's first talk about when pollinated because we're discussing strategies that plants will use. So grasslands are often full of the wind pollinated plants because the pollen, their, their strategy is to make lots and lots of tiny, tiny pollen grains and they blow out when they find a female flower. So it's basically like a shotgun approach, you know, hoping that a pollen grain will find a female flower. And these are useful in places like grasslands, but might not be so useful in other settings. Now look at the structure of a flower that is wind pollinated. It does not have the big showy petals, right? Because the big showy petals um, are not needed in this strategy. In fact, they would impede because imagine here's a little pollen grain, here's a little female flower hoping, hoping, hoping somebody lands on me and there's a big showy petal that says, huh, poo, deflecting. We don't want that to happen. So that's why grass, flowers are usually without these showy petals, even though they can provide a lot of the things that the insects like. And that's not to mean that grass flowers can't be very attractive. This is our purple muley, Muhlenbergi, Muhlenbergia capillaris, which we, a lot of us do use in our landscapes now. Great fall blooming grass, fabulous plant and native. Um, our junipers right now, I was riding down the road yesterday, coming back from North Mississippi, delivering a, a rescued puppy to a friend actually. And um, the juniper males are really showing their stuff. If you ride down the road right now, you can tell the girls from the boys, even on 75 miles an hour, because the males are very, very yellow. They're really loaded up. They're about to release their pollen 
and fertilize those females. So that's another wind pollinated plant. How would that affect your landscape choices? Some people are very allergic to this pollen. And some people might want the females too uh, because of the birds love the little blue cones, really we call them berries on the junipers. So, and again, if you want those, you need to have both around. So that may affect where you site them, although really you're probably not gonna get away from juniper anywhere in the state of Tennessee. <clears throat> Just to know that is kind of fun. You can glance at a tree, that's a boy tree. I don't have to lift the branches and look at the crotch. So other wind pollinated plants, you know, a lot of our conifers, our grasses, uh, ragweed, that's the reason we have so many ragweed allergies and poor old goldenrod that got blamed because look at all the pollen dust there. Any ragweed plant, when it's starting to bloom, bump it, you'll see it just billow out. But we don't see that, we see the goldenrod. That's why it's been blamed all these many years. We all need to speak up for it. It's a fantastic plant for our pollinators and honey beekeepers know that. They know that the bees can really load up there late in the summer on our many species of goldenrod. That strategy is not gonna work in wet, humid climates because that pollen grain is gonna land on a wet leaf surface and it's not gonna go anywhere. So they had to resort to other strategies and that was big showy flowers. And big showy flowers will ferry then the, the pollen from the uh, anther, the male parts, to the sticky stigma of the female parts. And so our, this pollen is often heavy and sticky and it has to be carried by insects. So uh, goldenrod pollen doesn't blow in the wind. It has to be ferried around by insects. You're not gonna get any in your nose unless you snort your goldenrod flowers. All right, so let's get back to um, how we're gonna try to avoid self-pollination if we've got these flowers that are perfect. We got both parts there, right? But we don't necessarily want that plant to self-pollinate or it doesn't want to, I'm speaking anthropomorphically. Ooh, I rolled that word out without enough caffeine. Um, because we want to get the gene pool spread around. We don't want this inbreeding thing going on. Um, some of them go to extremes. Some of them will do both. This is really cool. The violet, a lot of people wonder why it's so hard. Those of you who like to get rid of violets, um, I encourage them. They're a great host plant for some, some of our, our butterflies and they're edible, another good wild foraging plant. But they will do both. They're going to cover all bases. They have the flowers to exchange pollen and get some new genes and they will have uh, seeds from that pollination. But they also make an underground flower that does not need pollination. So the cleistogamous, think about a cloister, right? The nuns are staying in there and they are not getting pollinated. <laughs> and then the chasmogamous are spreading it around, getting a, a good exchange of genes. So they're going to make both. That's one reason you always find uh, the violets can be so vigorous and come back up and come back up and come back up. Really cool. Whereas we're going to our showy flowers now and we're going to look at how this flower, we don't want it, it doesn't want to pollinate itself. We're going to just go ahead and go with those terms and why that is, um, is discouraged by simply the structure of the flower. Those little white things you see are the female parts. That's your sticky stigma. So an incoming insect will hit those first and has hopefully already visited another flower. And then he goes on down to the good stuff, right? Way down there in the base of that, of that structure. Meanwhile, he's brushed through all those male parts, the little bristling yellow parts. He's gotten some more pollen on him. So when he departs or she departs, mostly females do this, um, she will carry that to the other flowers, carry and disperse that pollen. And you can see this in a lot of different plants. In lilies, it's very obvious. The sticky stigma juts out far beyond and then the male parts are, are seated behind. Now, another thing that might happen, because of course, sometimes the pollen grains are gonna land on that sticky stigma that belong to the same flower. And remember when that happens, that, that pollen grain has to germinate and swim, again, kind of similar to uh, humans, to the egg to fertilize that egg or those seeds, those ovules. So this, um, another way of avoiding that is this flower has the potential to recognize its own pollen and kill it before it gets to the egg, it will actually create a chemical that uh, kills that, that, uh, that burrowing pollen before it can actually get, you can see some here going on. We got some that tried to get there, some made it, some didn't. So the flower decided, hey, you're, you're good pollen from another sources and you're bad pollen from me. I don't want you, so it killed them off. Isn't that cool? Now, other thing, other plants avoid it by timing of the flowers and, and anybody who has, had this question needs to know this answer. 
why won't my pecan tree make any pecans? <clears throat> sitting there all by itself, good looking healthy tree, because it's sitting there all by itself, because they have ones that have the male flowers first and then later the female flowers come on, so it won't self-pollinate. Others do the reverse. They're gonna have female flowers come first and then the male flowers will follow. So what you need is one from each group and places that sell are good sources for pecan trees, and this probably ain't gonna be your local tractor supply store, uh, they, they will tell you which you need, what are good pollinators for which pecans. And also be sure you seek out disease resistant and phylloxera resistant. Don't plant the wrong pecan tree for your homeowner, okay? I have lists available, I can help you out, I can link you up. You may have to do a little bit special effort to find them, but again, that's what makes you the more worthy uh, person for the job. So, and look how different they are. The little female flowers just look like little baby pecans, don't they? And then the male flowers, they are made for hanging and blowing in the wind. And we who have parked under pecan trees or oak trees know these things will be on our windshield, right? Once they've done their thing. Other flowers have really, really interesting, and this is not a landscape flower, but still it may spring up somewhere in your wet spots. And Andrea probably knows and loves this flower because it is a fantastic um, native annual for our wet areas and a huge, huge plant for our hummingbirds. It is um, absolutely specifically designed for hummingbird pollination. And the, the hummingbird has to stick his whole head in that little flower to reach his tongue all the way around the back of that curve to get to the good stuff. And when he does, he has to really mash his head into that little cap. And by the way, the seed capsule that's dangling right below, I'm gonna show you that in miniature in just a minute when this flower becomes female. And if you've ever tried to gather um, impatient seed to get it started in a wet area, they will explode and blow little seeds everywhere. I finally managed to do that at my place by going down to the bottoms where I had a big colony of jewelweed. That's the name of this plant. It's an impatient, impatience capensis, but its common name is jewelweed. I went down there with a big garbage bag and threw it over the entire plant and pulled it tight at the bottom and then carried that garbage bag home and put it out where I wanted to get them started. Now I got galore, so warning, warning, they reseed by the thousands, but boy, are my hummingbirds happy. It's pretty cool out there. In fact, it's funny where my praying mantises often will set up to catch other insects that come in. So there he is, he's got to mash his head in there. And um, the first time I really started examining this, I learned about this, this plant. I was looking at him down the bottoms where I lived over in Luray Bottoms, and I saw those are little male parts, right? I mean, that, that's like it's supposed to. And then the, you see all the little pollen structures there that are about to release pollen. So this is close up and that's my dirty hand. And that one, look, it's different. And I thought that's weird. Um, usually, not always, when you have two you know, male and female flowers on the same plant, they look drastically different. So why are these looking the same, but this is male and that's female. But it turns out what this flower does is it starts out life as a male. Meanwhile, these are the female parts that's going to become that little seed capsule are developing behind the male parts and eventually they push the male parts off and the flower is a female. So it operates as a male the first few days of its life and then it becomes a female. It's a transgender flower. A cardinal flower does this. There's, there's actually a good number of these in our landscape, but it's a really cool thing to know about these plants that switch gender during the lifetime of the bloom. Yeah, I love my hummingbirds. I've got tons of feeders out and I can't wait to see them again come April. Uh, pawpaw is another interesting one to know. A lot of people will have pawpaws and they say, I've never seen any fruit. I said, well, they have to have a cross pollination, uh, another plant to cross pollinate. Well, it's a big colony of them, but that's all one pawpaw because they will be connected by an underground colony of roots. So they cannot self pollinate. You need to plant a separate seed grown individual near that colony because their pollinators don't fly far. Their pollinators are not bees, which will cover great distances. Their pollinators are flies and beetles, and they are attracted to odd scents. Usually flowers this color smell like carrion or rotting meat to attract those pollinators. Uh, I don't think the pawpaw to me smells like that. It's got a yeasty smell, but it does attract um, these, these pollinators. And you need, so you need two separate seed grown individuals pretty close by, or you're not gonna get the largest fruit on the North American continent with all kinds of cool history about it. And they're really quite good. They're a tropical tree that decided to survive the cold weather here and become a North American. Every other plant 
in that family just about as tropical and provides fruit for tropical regions that does taste very tropical. So it's called poor man's banana. <clears throat> it's also the host plant for our state butterfly, you know. The uh, Tennessee um, state butterfly is the zebra swallowtail. Little small fast butterfly, pretty difficult to photograph, but every now and then you, you do get lucky. And pawpaws are beautiful in our landscape. They have great fall color. They have a tropical look to them. They will make a colony unless you try to keep them from doing that. So you may want to place them accordingly or be religious about pruning up the new ones that come up if you don't want them coming, coming up as a big colony. And there, um, there is our, oh, spice bush. We're going in spice bush. Spice bush butterflies always look real, real um, leggy. It's one reason I can tell them usually from the other that butterflies that resemble them. And pipe vine, I'm sorry y'all, that was pipe vine. Again, not enough coffee. We grow this pipe vine uh, here at the station because pipe vine in the wild, I have actually never seen it in the wild. It's actually not common, at least not in West Tennessee. But this is a pipe vine plant from South America that grows easily right out in our parking lot. And every year we have huge populations of these caterpillars and get to watch the uh, pipe vine swallowtail caterpillars, cool little flowers. And this flower, Boy, this is a cool pollination story. Look at that. That's the reason it's called pipe vine. It's supposed to look like a Dutchman's pipe. Well, if you cut one in half and look at it like this, uh, this is one of those that's pollinated by flies. It doesn't have a, an appreciable odor that I can tell, but they find it attractive. They're going to crawl in there and you see all those little hairs in the throat that are aimed down. Once it gets going that direction, it cannot back up. It is forced into that chamber where it will pollinate that flower. Now, once that flower is pollinated, it recognizes the fact that it's pollinated. And at that point, it will droop and relax and those turgid hairs will relax and it allows that fly to escape. So the fly must not have found it that bad an experience because he'll go to another pipe vine flower and do the same thing. So that, that's a really fun story. And there's our little caterpillars. Now, this was another one, and I, I, I grant you, this is a weed um, if it's not where you want it to be because it does spread like suckers underground. It can be really hard to get rid of. So give it a good little wild area because this is a cool pollination story and a great host plant. It is pollinated by our large bees, bumblebees and such. And what they do is we're going to take a closer look at this structure. And by the way, whenever you see a flower with an odd structure, a lot of times, if you go research it, you'll find it's got a really interesting way of making babies. So you see him there, he's, he's walking around the base of that, he's looking for the good stuff that are right at that base, and we're going to look. But see those uh, little paddle-shaped things that are aimed down? If you look at them, you can see that's where the pollen is born. Those are the little yellow things, and he's walking around that structure trying to find the goodies at the base, and it's stroking him on the back, giving him that pollen on the back. If you look at the picture up on the right, you can see that round womb, right? That's our, that's our female part, and it wants to get the pollen from those male parts. Now, over here on the left, the male parts are sticking up in the air. This is what happens in the morning. And the bees that are visiting are going to be, hopefully, already visited another plant. But later in the day, the pollen, the pollen bearing structures, the male anthers begin to bend down, 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 and eventually, they're down as low where the bee's back can reach them too. So this actually functions as a male early in the day and a female part of the day. It's called flexistyle. So it's got all the parts it needs, but it's moving them around to get pollinated when it feels like it's got the best opportunity to get new pollen introduction. And I just think that is awesome. Oh, look at them. They're so cool. The flowers are so cool. The fruit's so good. We ate them green when we were little. We didn't know that we should wait till they got nice and wrinkled and soft. They smell like Hawaiian punch and they taste like Hawaiian punch. So I love having these on my property. Uh, simmer a little bit of that in just some water and you can make delicious jelly, very strong or add flavor to drinks. It's, it's a really easy wild plant forage. And there's our caterpillar. That is our Gulf Ritillary host. This is our native passion flower. I hope I said that at some point. I probably didn't. Uh, Passiflora cerula. Or is it incarnata? I always get those mixed up. Incarnata cerula. Somebody type it in the chat. I have a, a mental. I have dyslexia with some plants. With this and with uh, hornbeam and hop hornbeam. I just have dyslexia. I always get them backwards. So it looks like a bad caterpillar. Doesn't it look like he's going to sting you if you touch? But he is not. He is a the. Um, larva of this beautiful, beautiful large butterfly, almost as big as a monarch, almost as colorful. 
And uh, I had to throw this in. Somebody sent me this and said, you need your, you need this slide in your talk. And I said, yeah, that's pretty cool. 298 for orgasmic blueberries. I'm sure they meant organic, but. Uh, all right, other ones that are, you should know about is um, a lot of people like these plants that will bloom at night and provide fragrance. So we you know, call these the evening garden, the night garden plants. And the reason they're fragrant and the reason they're usually white or pale yellow is so the moths can find them in the night. So moon vine is one of those we can on, commonly grow from seed that will do this out in our garden. It doesn't open up, the blooms don't until the sun goes down and they release a delicious fragrance. How am I doing on time, y'all? You're doing good. Okay, cool. Uh, 15 minutes. Okay, great. I got to tell a quick story. Um, my niece was getting married down at the farm in Sesums, and my um, brother had the foresight to put an arbor out there in the lawn. It was going to be a, a sunset wedding and plant moonvine on it. And so the music starting, the bride and groom are coming down the aisle. The moon vine is opening and the uh, big uh, moths there, they're called sphinx moths or hummingbird moths, begin to arrive to pollinate them. They've got very long sphincters. They're really cool and they do look like hummingbirds. So they begin to arrive and they begin to visit the moonflowers over the bride's head and even the bouquets that were being held by the bridesmaids and even the rose petals up and down the aisle that had been strewn. And it was so funny because the person sitting next to me turned and said, how did y'all get hummingbirds to show up at the wedding. I said, oh, we're, we're just that special. When we go to the ocean, dolphins leap out of the water to greet us. So it kind of distracted from the wedding in a way, but it also made it absolutely unforgettable. Um, let's talk about some plants we should maybe talk people into tolerating more. I uh, found this huge, huge cocoon in my woodland and I kept it around and got it identified and was able to get to witness the fact that it was one of the largest North American silk moths. It is the Cecropia moth. And you see he's a boy because he's got that feathery antenna to find the girls and he's still all fat from coming out of that papery cocoon. And yeah, I got a really good picture of him close up, this cute little furry face. So a lot of people don't like moths, but this moth um, is absolutely fabulous and a really cool uh, sex life. He only lives eight days. And um, the only feeding you can do for him is as a caterpillar because they have no mouth. As an adult, they've got like eight days for a male and female to find each other, breed. And so most of their life is as a caterpillar. And then the cocoon will hang on that appropriate plant throughout the winter months and then they hatch out, they do this very quickly and that whole cycle has gone. One might think that's sort of sad, but maybe life as a caterpillar is great, right? Maybe this is the part that's really, really hard. And there's one that's done its thing and collapsed. Because the caterpillars are pretty cool looking critters, aren't they? That's pretty awesome, pretty awesome dude right there. He looks like a Chinese um, New Year's parade. I just think that's beautiful. And it's the host plant for not only that, oh, sweet gum is the host plant. And also for the Luna moth, and I know a lot of us love, we get excited, you can look online about how many pictures people take of the, of the Luna moths. Same group of moths, no mouth, and they're gonna feed on sweet gum. So let's encourage people, you know, if you've got a place you can leave those sweet gums out in the perimeter, you know, put those trees, they're fast growing, they'll grow anywhere, they give you good fall color, where the little gumballs don't bother people. It's all about siding some of these fabulous trees is where you put them. You don't want it right on your sidewalk, I'm with you, or right in your perfect lawn, don't do that. But out in the perimeters, it should be fine. And remember, a lot of birds eat the seeds off of these sweet gums too. And the flowers are really cool if you look at them. See, look at, this is the, uh, the, the male flower standing up and ready to release lots of pollen. And then if you'll look to the left in that picture, you see the female flower hanging down and that's gonna make that little a king laden fruit, which is really a fantastic, cool little thing. All right, I'm gonna mention just a little bit about the sex life of bees. We're gonna transition a little bit from plants to uh, knowing what bees are actually up to because they have a really interesting sex life. The queen is a slave. The colony controls everything about the queen. They decide even when they want a new queen, when to throw out the old queen. And don't ask me how they come to that. E.L. Wilson you know, has developed all these theories about um, these animals that are super beings. They, as a colony, it's a creature that makes these decisions. And he thinks humans, by the way, are too, but it's interesting. 
Um, so we see the worker bees, male bees, and the queen bee. And the queen bee, she, her job is lay eggs. That's it. And they decide when they need a new queen. So they start giving one of the larvae extra stuff, extra royal jelly, extra pollen cake. And they make more than one just to hedge their bets. And the queen bee is the only bee in the colony that has a smooth stinger. And that's because when she hatches first, or the one that does hatch first, she stabs to death the other queens. All right, so there they are making her lay. You know, they're feeding her, they're, she's laying eggs, she's working at it, working at it. She really only gets out of the colony when she gets kicked out, the old one. Well, I'm gonna talk about her prenup fight here in just a minute. Um, the old one leaves, I don't know how they just, you know, decide who goes with the old queen. You can't count off one, two, one, two. Now you ones go with the old queen and you twos are staying here with the new queen. But this is what they do while they're scouting for a new place to <clears throat> set up shop. Now a new queen, let's go back to her. She's got to get bread to be, you know, the egg laying machine she's meant to be. And so she goes out, she's not going to breed with her own males. You know, we're trying to avoid that, keeping the genes all together. We want new blood coming in. So they go out and find, and the male honeybees, the drones, are actually out hanging around these little areas, kind of cloud of drones, and the female will find them. But so this is all done by scent. They mate in the air. When they do, now his appendage has got these cool, weird barbs. Well, I don't know if it's cool for him, because once he pulls away from her after mating, um, it kills him. That, that comes out of his body. He's ruptured, and he falls to the ground dead. Um, hopefully he calls it getting lucky, I'm not sure, but certainly called hooking up. So that's a wild story. Now drones are pretty useless except for this. And the, um, the, the colony of she bees decided to make a few drones so that, you know, it could go off and pollinate uh, female queens from other drones. But once summer's over, they had no use for them and they starve them to death and they put them outside the hive and they're done with them so that they just aren't helping. They're, they're, uh, they're no longer an asset. Now, bumblebees will have separate colonies and bumblebees and some of our large bees, our, our little southeast um, blueberry bee, for example, some of our native bees can do some pollination types that honeybees cannot. So it's very important to garden for these native bees. And even though this is not a, a native crop, if you are gardening for red clover, if you're a red clover seed producer, they are only pollinated by bumblebees. So you really want to uh, be sure you've got good colony these around. So I discovered this cool kind of pollinating thing they do by discovering this wildflower, and this is Rexia. Rexia is real common in our woodlands, I mean, our, our fields out here in the wetland areas in, in late summer. It's a beautiful native perennial, and we probably ought to grow it more as an ornamental. And I looked close, and I thought, that is one weird flower structure that's got to have a story. And sure enough, it does. Um, what it does, there are You've heard a bee in a flower doing all kinds of zzz, 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 zzz. and you're like, what in the world is going on in there? And you'll look at them, they're kind of tumbling around in there. They're actually trying to find the right vibration. And when they do, it causes those male anthers to rupture and blow pollen all over his little hairy body. And then he can go take that to the other flower. So if that flower reminds you of tomato plants, it should because tomato plants also benefit from this type of uh, pollination. It's called sonication or buzz pollination. When they first started trying to grow greenhouse tomatoes, they hired people to hold vibrators up to the male flower, up to the flowers, excuse me, they're perfect, to the flowers of plants to get good tomato set. Now, then they started putting bumblebees in the greenhouses and now I think they've bred tomatoes where this is no longer necessary. But I'd love to have that on my job resume um, that I held vibrators to tomato plants for my first botanical job. Cool little plants. Look at those great little seed urns. They're awesome, aren't they? Um, by the way, if you'll look, uh, if you're interested, a lot of times you'll find a bumblebee asleep on a flower in the morning. Usually it's the male because again, the male's not really welcome back at the bumblebee colony because he's not bringing home pollen for the colony. Um, so look at him close. That's the male on the left. He doesn't have the little pollen bags. The females will have the pollen bags plus the male's hairier which you might expect, right? That's kind of typical with us as well. Um, come winter now, he's not gonna be, he's not gonna make it, nor are most of the worker bees in that colony. It's only the queen bee in that underground colony that survives, starts laying eggs and starts a colony again in the next year. A lot of cool things about bees, just a couple of other places that you might wanna explore. <clears throat> Now, just remember this encourage people to keep these. I had people who swore that toads were killing their plants, but actually they're great predators in our landscape. 
and they're going to need some water. You know, these are amphibians, toads and frogs, to um, reproduce. So a lot of people are worried about that. They don't want to leave standing water around because of the fact that um, it might breed mosquitoes. But I have never had that a problem where I have tadpoles, I don't find mosquito larvae. So, and there are also products that could kill mosquito larvae. Uh, the BTs, for example, you can float dunk around in that, but I love to hear them sing. I've got 11 different species of frogs and toads around my house that I've identified by sound. I haven't seen them all, but there are some good sites that will tell you about sound. Now, toads are pretty rude. Um, the male toad gives this long, beautiful trill and the female appreciates that he's the sexiest singer and she will appreciate that so much that she comes to him and it's only males that sing. Then there are uh, ones that don't sing as well and they call them the satellite males that are gonna surround the good singers and they may mob her if she approaches the one she wants. And if the water is a little too deep, they can drown her. They call them mating balls. It's a terrible thing. So toad sex is pretty rough and rude. Bullfrogs are much more considerate. Um, the female does like the male with the deeper, louder voice and they have territories around the pond. So she will approach that male and the other males respect that. And then the two will swim off in the water together and he embraces her and all the fertilization takes place in the water. It's kind of like that old story about getting pregnant in the swimming pool. That is what happens uh, with, with the frogs and toads. So uh, that's interesting. And in fact, if you look up bullfrog wrestling, when they are setting up their territories around the pond, uh, a male bullfrog does not want to tolerate another male bullfrog in his particular territory. And they throw themselves at each other like sumo wrestlers. I am not kidding. I've got them in my pond and I haven't ever gotten to witness it in person, but I'm often out there with my glasses, uh, binoculars when they're calling, hoping I can catch some acts of sumo wrestling bullfrogs. Bullfrog tadpoles are cool, by the way. They're huge. They can live up to four years in places where the Summers are shorter. Here, it's usually two years before they mature into a bullfrog, but golly, they're, they're, they're really awesome. I didn't know about spadefoots until um, I moved to my new house, which had never been farmed, which I think was important. It was steep, rocky, sorry land. And so the ground had never been disturbed. And that's, th that's why I think I have heard spadefoots there. And it's the only place I've ever heard them, uh, though it's actually a pretty common frog in the Southeast. We had had seven inches of rain after one of those hurricane systems came through. And finally, I was able to let the dogs out on the driveway to pee. And I could hear water rushing all through the valley. And I also heard a very odd sound in the woods going, Rah! just the most horrible sound, somebody stomping on a great blue heron. I thought, I don't know what that is, but it's gotta be something in the frog family. So I went and looked it up on one of those sites. Leaps.Tennessee is, is a really good frog site. And it turns out this is a, a toad frog, you know, they're really the same, um, that lives underground its entire life until we have enormous rains. And then it rushes above ground and breeds, they call it orgy breeding, and lays its eggs in these ephemeral puddles. And it's very quick, the whole thing, the tadpoles go through their whole metamorphosis very quick. And it's so that they won't be having to lay their eggs where there are predators. But a really interesting plant, uh, Toad, if you look them up, spadefoots, and there's their little spade that they dig underground. They dig under backwards. They live underground eating insects and, and grubs and stuff their entire life. Really cool. And there they are. All right. I probably, have I got enough, just a little more time? People don't like skinks. 10 minutes. 10 minutes. Little, little snaky looking, I admit it. But they are, again, very good predators. I love to see them. Um, I have raised beds built of concrete blocks and they live right there in my vegetable garden, which I'm thrilled will help uh, take care of the insect issues. Now they do a cool little thing. Um, the females kind of get together as a colony and they will all put their little eggs close together because they will actually help guard each other's eggs while one needs to go out and hunt for something to eat or drink. And it's uh, kind of a, we're gonna raise this as a community, we're gonna make babies. And I thought that was really sweet. A lot of people love to hate dirt divers. I grew up on a farm and I know how many times the problem is there's a dirt dauber, a mud dauber nest in that piece of equipment that won't work or won't crank. So I get that. And I know some people don't like to see the little homes that they construct on our walls, but I'm gonna ask you to look at this differently. That's a little mama, right? She's trying to make babies and goodness, look at what she's doing, toting insects back to pack into those wonderful colonies, the cater wasps. 
Look what these beautiful big wasps, very mild mannered, not gonna bother you. They are toting these gigantic cicadas back to their little burrow to pack down in there, lay an egg or two on. And then, by the way, they give more eggs to the females than the males um, because they need more uh, nutrient. And they even can tell that in the egg stage. And, and they can't even fly well with these things. They fly a little piece and then they'll climb back up on a post or a, a sapling and launch themselves off again, fly as far as they can before they hit the ground. It's a lot of work. That is, that's hard work. Don't stomp them. Don't stomp them. They're on our side. There she is stinging and par they paralyze them. They don't really kill these insects because they want it to be fresh for their larva when those eggs hatch out. Look at the little mama. She is packing little mud balls. Now the male will kind of guard her while he's doing it. He's not totally useless, but she's doing all the building. She's got to go find mud puddles. And as she does, she starts to make chambers and she goes and paralyzes spiders. And that's her larval food. And she packs those chambers full of little paralyzed spiders. You ever break this open? Look at them, they're moving very slowly like zombies. I also think it's cool, look on the left. See all the different colors of mud? She had to go to different puddles when it was drier and had to collect different kinds of mud. So you can kind of see there um, as the area <coughs> got wetter or drier, <coughs> the different soil she had to use to make her babies. <coughs> so those of you who hate spiders may be glad to have dirt daubers. Although I encourage those of you who hate spiders to think of the fact that spider web, one of the most important components of your hummingbird nest. Without spider web, you would not have hummingbird nests. So remember that too. I'm trying to convert my man friend to be a spider lover. I'm having a hard go of it. Dragonflies were one of your best mosquito predators. You know, the, the swallows that get so much attention really don't eat a lot of mosquitoes. That's too small of a payback for the energy that it takes to catch a mosquito. They prefer to go after the larger insects. But dragonflies go after them and they go after deer flies and all those things that bite us when we're out there. And also their young will, their um, underground, their underwater larva. So this guy, by the way, you might think this is a, a, a sexual thing, a reproductive thing, sticking that tail up in the air, like, look at me, ain't I cool and tall? But it's not, it's actually called the oblique position. And you, if you look, it's always pointed at the sun. It's a way to reduce the amount of sunlight striking his body so that he can stay cooler on a hot day. All right, well, here we got it going on. We got a male and a female and that looks so sweet. It's got a heart shape, doesn't it? It is not sweet. She has grabbed, she is grabbed. She's the one on the bottom. He grabbed her, look at his tail by the back of her neck and he has clamped down and he ain't letting go till she gives it up. So she does, she lifts her parts up to him and that's where the exchange goes on but he's still in letting her go because he didn't want another male impregnating his woman. So then he carries her over to the water and drags her around while she lays the eggs. So you may have seen this. I've actually seen it with some really dumb male dragonflies out here in the parking lot, banging the girl on blue shiny hoods of cars thinking it was water. So it's, it's rough stuff, dragonfly sex, probably not that much fun. There's that oblique position. I, I thought that was coming up here. I do. They're very cool insects. They're dragonfly societies, by the way, if you want to pursue that further. And there's our dragonfly nymph. It can not only eat lots and lots of mosquito larvae, but even small minnows. They're pretty fierce, cool creatures. Look them up. There's a lot of uh, YouTube videos of, of dragonfly larvae eating stuff. All right, I'll start winding it up. Um, mainly, I want you to talk your clients into letting you plant what I call multi-purpose plants for wildlife. You know, a lot of people want to screen. Well, there's no reason a screen can't be several different, we encourage it to be several different mixed species. It can provide cover for lots of wildlife nesting places, for example, it doesn't have to provide, you know, food for everything. All, all plants don't need to provide all things. Some are just going to provide cover. Uh, our native anise tree, it doesn't have anything particular for wildlife. In fact, it's toxic, it's foliage is for wildlife, but it provides great cover and it'll thrive in a whole lot of different situations. And it's a fantastic screen plant. So if you pick these multi-purpose, so I call it a bountiful boundary. Instead of a screen, why not a bountiful boundary that provides cover, flowers for our pollinators, edible foliage, mix some in there, you know, so there'll be some intact plants when the caterpillars are eating up some of the other plants. And then the fruits, some of our favorite birds, for example, bluebirds, um, woodpeckers, 
cardinals, thrashers, they live on um, dried seeds, dried berries through the winter months because there are no insects for them at that time. And then of course, pretty, we want pretty plants. So you can get all of those with the right plant selection. I'm going to end there. Um, I know we could, I could go on about this forever and I have learned <laughs> that I could go on about this forever. One of the things to get out is understanding your flaws. Um, I do have like five minutes for questions. If y'all want to try that. Well, we could listen to you forever too, Carol. That's the, <laughs> that's the problem here. The good part. It was very excellent. I appreciate it. And yeah, we do have five more minutes to pull us up to the top of the hour. That'd be great if anybody, I shared that um, several years ago, the Volkswagen uh, plant called me and said they had all these black spots on their the hoods of their darker cars. And so we went over there and observed for a while. And finally, we discovered I scratched off some of it and saw the eggs and uh, realized it was dragonflies because they were trying to encourage, I mean, that plant is right in the middle of a nice wild, wild uh, area with the wetness, it was a pond area. So they were, so they put white covers on their hoods just to try to keep that off. That's great. And I am having, you know, landscapers report that the their customers now are requesting, you know, ways to, you know, they don't want to all the chemicals these days and they're asking for more diverse landscapes and ways to control problems. And diverse landscapes are a great way to do that. So there is demand, um, we need to, exploit that, I think, you know, for the good of everything. And also because it's economic opportunity. These are often the more educated people that are probably going to pay, pay more for that type of um, approach to their landscapes. Great, Carol. Well, that was really, really wonderful, Carol. Thanks so much. Here I was Thank thinking you. you were a plant person, but you're so much more than that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, 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 Tennessee Extension so Service. So much more, yeah. Thank you. I'm a, I'm a voyeur, right? There you go. <laughs> walk There's around and just look at stuff, and this is what's going on, y'all. They're babe, making babies out here. <laughs> that was a great topic. Thank you for joining us, Carol. Thank you, and I hope I made it a part of the landscape industry. I, I do think it's important. Thank y'all. Absolutely. <laughs>